Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this week's session of Solid Finances. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're five past the hour. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Montana State University Extension and NDSU Extension. Uh, without them, this series would not be possible. Just a reminder of the resources on our website. Uh, if you're looking for the upcoming schedule, contact information, we have recordings of past sessions. If you've missed any from this year or from previous years, you can go back and watch them. We do try and keep um, a look. Uh, we try and review those periodically. So if the information is out of date, we do pull them off. So those on the website should have um, pretty relevant information. And then also the resources for uh, today's session and any past sessions. So if you're looking for some of the resources that we've talked about during these presentations, you can find a link to those within the um, session description. Uh, just a reminder of how to do chats and um, provide feedback or ask questions today. We've got the chat feature. We also have the Q&A. Um, one thing I do want to mention, I've, we've had this question the last two weeks. So if you've been a, a, a viewer for multiple years, you will not be hearing music at the beginning of our sessions anymore. Um, we're on a different platform and it's just something that uh, we just don't do at, uh, on this platform. So don't panic at the beginning if you don't hear music come up. But again, that's that's been asked the last few weeks, so I did want to address that quickly. Uh, again, here's our website. Uh, that first arrow it will take you to the logon information, uh, logon links for every session. So that's maybe how you got in today, unless you had signed up for an email reminder, which is that second blue arrow down on the left hand side of your screen. And if you have not signed up for um, the reminder emails, uh, you can do that. It will just send you a reminder um, the day before, I believe, uh, the day before the session to kind of give you that heads up that um, the session is coming up on Wednesday. Uh, next few sessions, next week, I will be talking about budgeting, uh, getting the most from your money. And then we're going to take a little break and come back in December and we'll start off the next kind of block with tips for good credit management. And again, I will be presenting that session as well. So today we're talking about refinancing a mortgage. Uh, Joel Schumacher, who if you've been on these in the past, you'll you'll probably have heard from him many of times. He's an associate extension specialist at Montana State University and also the family consumer science program leader there. And this series would not be possible without him. It was developed by him, what, nine years ago, quite a while ago. So uh, again, he's gonna talk to us a little bit today about what you need to know about refinancing your mortgage. All right, well, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate the uh, introduction and going over the kind of housekeeping tips. So um, welcome back, everyone. Um, so today's topic is going to be refinancing a mortgage. And we've done several sessions over the years um, related to refinancing and understanding loans. Um, and it's really interesting as I looked back at some of the old slides um, preparing for this, um, how much things have changed, specifically in the recession we're in now compared to the recession where we were in in 2009 so uh, and refinancing is a, is a big difference between the two so we'll uh, i might add in a few comments as we go about um, what changed in the last decade so in terms of things you need to know if you're considering a refinancing uh, the first thing that really comes down to making all your decisions is you need to know about your current loan so what is your current balance? How many payments do you have remaining? What's your interest rate? Um, is that an adjustable rate or is it a um, fixed rate? Um, within that monthly payment amount, we also wanna know what that principal and interest amount is. Um, and then also what part is not principal and interest, which might include your homeowner's insurance, uh, maybe your taxes, maybe a private mortgage insurance, and that collectively all may go to an escrow account um, so it may be labeled that way on your payments, those things that are not part of the principal and interest. Um, and then very rarely, but um, there are a few loans that have a prepayment penalty. So you just wanna know if you happen to have um, a loan like that. Um, 
And if you have an amortization schedule, which lists the principal and interest payment each month all the way through the life of your loan, that can be really handy. If you've made additional payments over the years, or if you've lost that original amortization schedule, um, you can recreate one and um, I'll show you a couple of resources um, where we can do that if you don't have one, but um, would like to have one in kind of your decision making process. So the next piece of after we know a little bit about reasons um, or about our current loan, I want to know why you're thinking about refinancing. Um, sometimes it's you want to lower your monthly payment. So maybe um, you just would like to spend some more funds on other things. Maybe it's you're going from a two income to a one income household. Um, and maybe that was a choice you voluntarily made. Maybe someone in the household has lost um, their job or has reduced income. You know, those are all you know, very legitimate reasons. Other folks are simply looking to get a lower interest rate, knowing that less interest they pay, um, kind of the better. Um, rates are low right now, so that's a pretty common reason. Um, sometimes it's lower interest over the life of the loan. So maybe um, you're actually willing um, to make higher payments now in terms of reducing your interest um, collectively over the whole time period. Maybe you want to get that loan paid off so that you can either move on to your next goal or maybe retire earlier um, or simply just be um, free of having that monthly payment. Um, so that's a common goal as well. There's also folks that need to need or want to access equity in their home for some other current use. So maybe you want to do a remodeling project or maybe you are going to help a um, child through college or, your, or yourself or your spouse. Um, so we call that a cash out refinance where we're taking cash out of the equity in our home um, to do that. And the reason, um, I guess the last one here, um, is just switching from an adjustable rate loan to a fixed rate. So adjustable rate loans, um, oftentimes uh, they're lower interest rate, at least at the um, initial point, um, but they could potentially rise um, after the reset period, and we'll talk a little bit about these in a minute, um, to a higher rate, and you don't want that possibility of, of the rate rising. Um, so that can be another reason that people want to get their interest rates set and locked in. But it's important to know which of these, and it might be more than one of these, um, that you're interested in accomplishing. Because we can go through a couple different scenarios um, where a new loan accomplishes two of the three of, or two of these or one of these or maybe even three or four of these. Um, but if it doesn't match with what your situation is, um, then that's not a good reason to write, refinance if that loan doesn't meet doesn't check the box in terms of what you're going for. All right, um, so a couple things to keep in mind, that some common questions I get. Um, first of all, refinancing your mortgage is a new loan. So you're not renegotiating with your current lender. You might be using the same lender, but you're applying for a brand new loan, which means they're gonna check your credit worthiness, just like you walked in and the day you applied to them initially, and they're going to check things like your income, what other debt do you have outstanding, uh, both totals and in terms of monthly payments. Um, they're going to check that credit score or your credit report. Um, they're also going to um, check the value of that property that you're going to use as collateral, which in the case of most home mortgages is the home. And this is a big difference from 2009. Part of um, the challenges in 2009 was um, property values sort of collectively went down fairly significantly during that recession. So when it came time to refinance, we had, pe had people that maybe had bought a home at $300,000 and had put, let's just say, $30,000 down. Um, and then the value of that home has now shrunk to $260,000 with an outstanding loan of $270,000, um, which made it very difficult for applicants to refinance, even if the rate was lower. Um, because their the value of their property you know had lost value now in terms of this recession um at least um, a lot of the western states or montana where we're at we've actually seen strong price increases recently um, strong demand for property so that value of the property going down is typically not a problem for current um, homeowners looking to refinance so big advantage um, compared to um, 2009 in terms of that opportunity there um, the other thing, too, many people will buy their home with their spouse. Um, so if you have a co-applicant, they're going to check uh, all of these same facts on who your um, co-applicant is um, as well. 
So a couple things you can do to kind of prep yourself for this. Um, one is just a good idea anyways, and one is to check your free credit report. Um, and that's available at annualcreditreport.com. Uh, there's a whole lot of other fake sites that look like free credit report or free credit score that are really um, selling something to you um, or they are um, simply a, a purely fraudulent site. So annualcreditreport.com is the place to go and you're going to get a free credit report which lists things like on-time payments, where your loan balances are and information like that. It's not going to give you an actual score. Usually at the end, um, you may have an opportunity to purchase that score, but you don't have to do that. You can just get the report, which is the information on which your score is based. Now, um, again, a change from 10 years ago, uh, many banks and credit card companies are actually providing your credit score to you um, for free, um, either quarterly or monthly on your statement. Um, so just an easy thing you can do is take a look at your last statement and see if they're providing that information um, to you for free already. So, and that's the score that they might be providing as opposed to the report. Um, your new lender um, is going to check that almost certainly when they uh, when you do apply. Um, so certainly when you apply, they're going to pull that information for you. But this gives you some information before you walk in there um, to know what the lender might um, tell you in advance or if there's a problem on your credit report, like it says you're late with your power bill but you're not, you can call the power company prior to that and see if you can get that resolved before you um, apply. So if you know in advance, it gives you just a little bit of time to address any potential issues that might come up. Um, property value, this is the, the thing I was mentioning a little bit earlier. Typically your home is your, is your collateral um, for that mortgage. Um, and the lender's going to want to know what the loan to value ratio is going to be. So if you're going to buy a $350,000 house and you would like a $225,000 loan, the lender is then lending 64% of the value of the home. Okay. Once that loan to value ratio gets above 80, many lenders are going to require private mortgage insurance. Um, private mortgage insurance um, is a premium that you pay. Um, it's going to help protect the lender if you default and the property is worth less than um, what they can recover by selling it. So it's not really insurance that protects you. You're buying insurance um, for the risk they're taking um, by lending you this higher amount. And when that loan to value gets over 95%, um, oftentimes it can be challenging um, to refinance through a traditional lending program. So again, this is where we had some issues in 2009 of people may have put, had, you know, a loan to value at 80 or 90% originally, but because the value of the property went down, the new loan to value ratio would be above 95 or often even above 100%, which left a um, really challenging position for many borrowers who saw lower rates but were um, unable to get them specifically because of this particular um, issue. Private mortgage insurance, this is what um, I just mentioned, that it's oftentimes required by your lender if you've got less than, um, I'm sorry, less than 20% equity in the home. I've written that uh, first bullet point wrong there. So if you put less than 20% down, many times you're going to have to purchase this. There are some exceptions if you're going through some of the more specialized programs like um, the Veterans Administration loans or some FHA loans. Um, there are some programs that allow people to waive um, that 80% rule and kind of get around it in some different ways. But most standard loans, that's going to be the policy. Um, premiums on these range, and you may or may not be shopping for this. It may be your lender that's actually determining who's providing that. Um, but it could range anywhere from 0.25% to 1.25% of that loan per year. So on a $200,000 loan, that cost could range anywhere from on a low end, $250 up to maybe $1,250. Um, and, and the premiums may vary based on what your loan to value ratio is. So if you're at, you know, 82%, you might get a lower premium than if that loan to value ratio is 95. So they could vary some, not just on the size of the loan and the company to company, but also on what your loan to value ratio um, is. So we've got a, a really good question and I, I think I've got a slide a little bit later on, but I'm going to jump ahead here and let's see if I've um, got it here. Yeah, so we do have a question. It really um, relates. The question is, does the private mortgage insurance um, 
go away automatically after the loan to value falls below 80%. So that's exactly what I wanted to talk about here on this slide. So once you do continue to make payments, and even if we just assume that the property value remains constant, your loan to value ratio should go down each month as you pay down um, the loan. Um, so theoretically, we're gonna get under that 80% range. And in fact, we're gonna know when it is if our um, original value of the home doesn't change by just looking at our amortization schedule, we can see how many how long it's going to take and maybe it's 41 months maybe it's 36 months you know depending on how high it was to start with and what the uh, payments are um, but it is important to find out what the cancellation policy or procedures are for that private mortgage insurance um, the very first time i bought a home um, we did have private mortgage insurance and we were making additional principal payments each month so after about um 21 months, um, our loan to value ratio fell below um, the 80% limit. And I called to see if I could cancel it. And um, at that point, um, they had a policy that said um, within the first two years that that loan is taken, um, if you call in to cancel it in the, in the position we had where we had paid ahead, um, they required an appraisal. Well, the appraisal was gonna be about $400. The private mortgage insurance was $40 a month. Um, so it was actually cheaper for us to continue to pay it for four more months and call in once the 24 month rule had expired, get it canceled without a new appraisal than it was to pay for an appraisal to get it canceled. Um, many policies automatically cancel when your loan to value reaches 78% or 79 or so, some set amount. Um, so just ask in advance about that if you are going to have private mortgage insurance, what the policies are, if there's any caveats about requiring an appraisal, and if there is one who would pay for it, um, just so you don't, you know, you have full knowledge then walking in of how long you'll pay this um, and how to get it canceled when the time comes. Thanks for that question, by the way. Um, so there's going to be some fees involved with refinancing and they can vary from lender to lender. Um, there may be a, a generic loan application fee, it might be a loan origination fee, which is usually a percentage of the value of the loan. Sometimes you're going to be required to have a appraisal done on site. Other times um, lenders are willing to waive that depending on how much equity you have and do a um, I'm going to call it a virtual appraisal where they're just going to compare recent sales in your area, comparable homes. Um, home inspection is usually not required because you already own the home, um, but it might be that some lenders would want something like that. And then there could be a variety of um, miscellaneous closing fees. Um, title insurance is probably going to be required. Um, I think I have an extra answer here. It should be. Um, your survey certificate or your um, flood um, certificate of where you fall um, in the survey for your flood map. You know, and uh, recently when we purchased a house, I think that was $8.95, but it was required um, fee. So collectively, we're gonna know, wanna know what each of those are. You know, here's just some rough estimates. These can vary um, fairly widely, depending on where you're at in the country and which lender you have. You may also see lenders that have, let's say a higher application fee, but a much lower origination fee. So you really wanna kind of collectively look at what the total of these are, um, as opposed to maybe saying, oh, the application fee is lower at lender A, so that must be a better place to apply. We wanna look at them collectively at what that total uh, fee structure is. Now, in the news recently, um, there's two large uh, government sponsored enterprises that buy well over half of all mortgages in the US and they don't lend directly to consumers, but what they do is when a bank or credit union makes a loan, um, essentially the bank then sells your loan to one of these entities that turns it into a mortgage backed security. Um, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are two of the biggest ones. There's a couple other um, somewhat similar um, government sponsored enterprises that do a little bit of mortgage lending as well. Um, and they are both have had some significant losses. 
over the last nine months here related to coronavirus um, events. Um, so they plan to implement a new half a percent refinancing fee called an adverse market refinancing fee. Um, and it was originally going to start on September 1st. They have pushed that back to December 1st. Um, and they will exempt loans under $125,000. And part of the reasoning behind that is um, about 80% of the borrowers that have those smaller loans um, are lower income borrowers. So um, they're kind of protecting lower income borrowers or at least trying to not um, adversely affect them. But if it's a $200,000 loan um, and your mortgage is one that's going to be refinanced, likely the lender is going to pass that cost on to you. Um, so that'd be a $1,000 fee starting um, kind of December um, 1st. So if you are thinking of refinancing now, you may want to get in touch with your lender and see if you can beat that December 1st um, deadline. Now, they don't buy all loans. Some banks will keep some loans in house and not resell them. And then of course this fee wouldn't factor in. If you're going through say um, a veterans administration loan or uh, maybe some of the special programs within your state, those also may not be um, affected by this fee. And then again, if you have a smaller loan, it may not be um, affected. Um, so, but if you're over it and you think it might be potential and you're right on the line in terms of whether or not you wanna do it before December 1st, um, this might be a factor where you want to hurry up and get that done uh, prior to that. And also recognizing there's going to be some time frame to get this thing funded and appraisals and paperwork done. So you don't want to wait until November 30th um, to see if you can beat the deadline. So if you're, if you're thinking about it, um, I'd start a little bit ahead of that December 1st deadline to try to avoid this fee if possible. The next thing that um, you're going to do in a refinancing process, and you can look online to start with before you necessarily even make an application. These are usually accessible at a lot of different um, financial institutions websites, but see what the interest rate quotes are. And these are probably going to be generic in some sense because they're not going to know your credit history, the value of your property, but some of them may say for prime borrowers with loan to value ratios below, you know, 70 percent you know and then they'll give a quote that looks something like what's on the um, screen here and what we've got um, is you're going to see the first one here is a 30-year loan it has a fixed interest rate over all 30 years and the interest rate one option is to have 2.65 percent with 1.5 points that you're going to pay up front and we'll show here how we calculate how much points cost um, but then you may also, in this case, have a same offer from a, um, the same institution that says 2.875%, so a higher interest rate, but then lower um, points. 15-year loans um, tend to have lower interest rates. Now, the gap between them has narrowed as all rates are really at um, near all-time lows. But um, So it's likely to see a 15-year loan have a lower rate. And then what we've got here is a 30-year loan at the bottom with an adjustable 5-1 rate. Um, oftentimes, these an adjustable rate loan will be lower than the comparable length of loan. So in this case, the 30-year loan here, we have 2.5% instead of 2.65%, and the points are lower as well. But the risk here is that after five years, then every year, um, it's possible for that interest rate to adjust to whatever the current market conditions are. Now, since we're at historical lows now, um, I think it's likely that in five years, um, we won't be at historical lows. So that's sort of a risk that a borrower would take of taking these adjustable rate loans is five years down the road, um, it's quite possible the interest rate will increase. So you want the lower rate now for this risk of the rate uh, going up in the future. So now let's um, talk about how we figure out what those fees are, or those points are actually going to cost us. So all a point is, is it's a fixed dollar amount fee that is um, charged to you when that loan is issued. Um, if you pay this higher fee on kind of day one of the loan, you're going to get a lower interest rate and thus lower payments through the life of the loan. So it's this trade-off of, will I pay more up front to have lower interest down the road? Um, or do I want to pay less points to have a little bit higher interest rate um, over the life of the loan? 
So the way a point is um, calculated, um, say 1.25 on a $100,000 loan, is we're just going to multiply it like a percent. So 1.25 points is 1.25 percent. Um, so it would be $1,250 fee up front if you had 1.25 on a hundred thousand dollar loan so you can just multiply those out and kind of see what that cost would be um and then you can decide you know whether or not that's good in exchange for um the lower interest rate so we have had a question um come in here and it says can you elaborate a little bit on points um if the market rate's being advertised in the two and a half to three percent range for a 30-year rate why would one want to um buy points to get a rate uh, rate in that percentage range yeah so that's a good question um so the whole reason when you pay higher points almost certainly that's going to lower the interest rate um, that they're going to offer you so if you're at any bank or, or um, credit union they've got some different combinations that are available to you so um let's just say that let's go back one slide here to um, this top one because I have two different examples. Um, so what we would be saying here on this top one is, would you be willing to pay these um, additional one point, I think it's one, two, five points, that is the difference between those two um, rate quotes there at the top, to get this 2.25% lower interest rate, okay? So the way we would determine this, and we will go through an example here a little bit later in the presentation, uh, one, we'd figure out how much those points are in terms of the specific dollar amount for your loan. So if you're borrowing $90,000 versus $230,000, we'd multiply out those points. You'd also want to run the calculation of what your monthly payment amount, how much lower it would be using the two different interest rates. And I'm just going to pick a number, a couple numbers off the top of my head, but let's say that you paid an additional $1,000 in points to save $25 a month in interest payments. Is that a good deal? Well, um, it depends on how many months you intend to own the home. Um, so that's kind of the trade-off there. If you're only gonna, if you have this lo uh, loan for, let's say two years, so that'd be $25 um, times 24 um, payments, which I think is $600. Um, paying that additional $1,000 would not have paid off for you because you paid $1,000 up front to get $600 worth of savings over two years. Now, if you were to have owned that home for 10 years before you either sold it or refinanced, then we'd have 120 payments that were $25 less. That amount will decline a little bit as you pay it down. Um, and in that case, then paying that additional $1,000 was probably um, worth it to you. Um, in terms of a cash flow example. So that's kind of the way um, I like to think about points. And oftentimes the lender you work with can help talk you through that example too, in terms of what the additional upfront cost would be versus what that monthly savings would be. Another thing with um, loans, shorter loans um, have higher payments, but it's going to lower your total interest over the course of the loan. So you're borrowing less money um, for less amount of time. That's how to think about those. So a 30-year loan, um, your monthly payment, um, $843. But if we went to a 15-year loan, again, interest rates are typically lower. But even if they weren't, the monthly payment will be higher. But the total interest over these two um, examples here you know, it's more than twice as much interest and only a little bit of that is due to the rate actually being lower. So if you can go to a 20 year loan instead of a 30 or a 15 instead of a 20, um, gives you an opportunity to really lower the total interest payments that you're gonna pay um, collectively. And we do have a question. Um, can you get a five year loan? Um, absolutely, yeah. Many lenders will be able to um, do five, 10, 15, 20, um, 30. I don't know if I've seen a 25, but it might be possible as well. If the lender is um, keeping the bank loan in-house, they may also be able to work it backwards. If you want to pay $1,000, they might figure out that that's going to be a 12-year loan and they may be able to make it um, in that sense. 
if they're going to resell it, it's a little harder to sell some of those, so they may not uh, make those odd year, you know, a 16 or a 13 year loan available. We also have another question. I have about 20 years left on my 30 year mortgage. Can you negotiate a 20 year um, refinancing as an alternative to the standard 15 or 30? And I would say absolutely, especially since it's an even number. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, those are going to be things that pretty much every lender is going to be able to um, make an offer to you. The other thing, too, a lot of times when people are in that situation, they've got 20 years left on a 30 year mortgage, rates have gone down. So it's possible that you'll be able to go to a 15 year loan and still lower your payment and shorten the length. So um, 20 years might be available to you, but you might wanna take the advantage of um, shortening your loan at the same time. Um, so let's see, we already did our points example here, um, but this is exactly what I was just kind of talking through a minute ago. We've got a couple different options on a 30 year loan for 200,000. In this case, 0.2% um, is the lower amount by um, paying $1,500 extra. So it saves them $21 per month for that $1,500 kind of upfront fee. Um, so that would take 71 months um, to um, recoup kind of the money they paid for that fee. Um, so we did have somebody comment that their lender wouldn't do a 10 year loan, but they um, calculate an amortization table. So when I did a 15 year loan, um, you're just paying extra so that you can pay it in 10. Um, yeah, that's certainly possible. I know um, when I refinanced last time, the interest rate was the same at my lender for a 10 or a 15. So certainly you can make the 15 year loan and then set up your automatic payments to be the higher amount if you'd like. So some lenders may wanna do it um, that way. And that actually probably allows them to just remarket it a little bit differently. So, um, but if you truly do want a 10 year loan, there are lenders that will make that um, to you. So if, if a lender can't um, get you what you need, certainly that's a pretty common request and there are other lenders that can do that. Adjustable rate loans. Um, you don't hear as much about them now, especially since interest rates are quite low relative to kind of historical standards. Um, but the interest rate can change over the course of it. Um, in this case, you notice after these quotes, they'll say something like 5-1 or 3-1 or 7-1. And what that's telling you is that interest rate is going to be fixed for the first five years of that loan if it's a 5-1. And then it's going to adjust each year after that. If it's a 7-1, it'll stay fixed for a period of seven years and then adjust. Rate adjustments are based on some kind of published loan rate that's out there, um, plus a percentage point, um, some set amount. So it'll say prime rate published in the Wall Street Journal on the first of the month, plus 1.7% or something is what it will adjust to. Is something that will be stated in your original loan that it's gonna be this prime rate plus some number and what date that that rate is that they're gonna use. And that's kind of the, um, possibility in terms of how it will adjust after that initial period of being fixed is completed. Um, they're not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes uh, people have a bad um, view of these because there is that potential for the payments to go up. So if you don't understand that, um, some people are, are frustrated when it happens. Um, but if you went in saying, you know, hey, I took a two point three five percent loan instead of two point four five by having the adjustable rate loan saved me $13 a month for five years, um, and then my rate adjusted up, um, maybe that's still a trade-off you're willing to make, especially since many people either refinance or move to a different home. Um, that fixed rate at a lower amount for that initial period might be a good financial decision, but there is that risk um, that the rate could go up. Um, so another question, I've heard that it's not worth refinancing if the gain is not more than 1%. For example, if I have a 4.25%, would it um, be worth refinancing only if it was um, to get to a 3% rate? Um, I wouldn't, the rule of thumb calculations are kind of like a back of the envelope thing. Um, depends on how much your loan is, how long you intend to stay in the home. Um, but also, like I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes it's not just a math problem. Sometimes it's about cash flow. Sometimes it's about when you want to retire and have it paid off. Maybe it's about um, helping a child go through college. 
Um, so it's actually pretty easy to walk through um, comparing examples. Um, so I would actually recommend that you crunch a few numbers yourself, just looking at some internet tools and see if you're in the ballpark. Um, and then, you know, if it's what you think is worth your effort to go through the, um, the actual application process, um, then you can, you know, decide if it needs to be 0.6% or 1.1 uh, based on how long you want to stay in the home and how large your uh, loan is. So this is just a kind of a follow-up example here on these adjustable rate loans. Um, and these were, were two current uh, quotes from a, from a national bank that if you were to take their 30-year fixed versus their 30-year um, adjustable rate mortgage, you'd be saving in this case uh, $23 per month for the first five years. Um, average American, I think, stays in a home something like seven years. So you're locking in five of those seven if you were kind of the average borrower. So is it worth it to take that, uh, you know, roughly $250 savings each year for five years with the risk that it could potentially go up in the future? You know, um, those are just kind of things looking into the future that you, you'll kind of have to decide. There's not necessarily a clear crystal ball answer. If you knew exactly when you were going to either sell the home or refinance the home, you know, then it becomes a math problem. But you're kind of looking into the future. But this is kind of the trade offs that you need to consider um, when looking at an adjustable rate mortgage. Now, this is also something that's changed a lot since 2009. Um, interest on a mortgage um, is typically deductible for your main home, uh, but you have to take advantage of itemizing your expenses to um, get any benefit from this. The standard deduction is significantly higher now than it was in 2009. So in 2009, I think most people that had a mortgage of probably over 50 or 60,000 um, were able to itemize and then essentially reduce their taxes um, to some extent by the amount of this um, interest that they paid. However, the standard deductions went up, which for many people is a, a good thing, um, but it also means that your interest on your mortgage isn't deductible because you're taking the standard deduction instead of itemizing your deductions. Um, well, it just kind of changes the math a little bit. There's an IRS publication, number 936, that kind of goes over um, a lot more of this. And I will show one example of if you are itemizing, um, how, to, how to incorporate that into our kind of months until we get repaid. Um, but just to give you kind of put in the ballpark, the first year of interest on a 30-year mortgage at, for a $200,000 loan at 3.5%, which is kind of roughly the rates today, um, that's about $7,000. So if you were to get to, if you're just a single person, you would need to have um, another $5,200 of other itemizable deductions for it to be worthwhile for you to itemize instead of take the standard deduction. So a lot of folks are gonna find that they simply don't have enough um, deductions to get there and they're taking the standard deduction, which um, makes this calculation just a little bit simpler. Okay, now in the resources for today, which are on the same website that you logged in from, I put a couple links out there, and one of them was to this, it's actually quite old now. Um, the Federal Reserve had um, this checklist, and I've, it's a dozen questions to ask. I'm only showing about the first 10 just because it didn't fit on the screen very well. Um, but this lets you compare what your current um lender or what your current loan has and then what some different options might be maybe that's a different combination of points and interest rate um, maybe that's also um, a 15 year versus a 30 year loan okay so and you can write these down just fill out this chart and that should help kind of quantify and get in one place some of the things that we've been um, talking about so far um, we have had a question come in um, how to calculate the interest um, for a full year on a loan. So the easiest way to do this is to find your amortization schedule. So if you have one on your current loan, you can certainly go take a look at it. However, if you've made additional principal payments, it's not going to be um, correct anymore because you'll be paying less interest than that. Um, so you can go to, there's a couple resources I linked on our resources page. One of them is powerpay.org, which is run by Utah State University's um, extension service. So it's a 
free provider, but you can type in loan payment, interest rate, current balance, and it will generate um, an amortization schedule for you. And then you just need to add up and it'll even put it into Excel for you, um, but you can just add up those 12 um, interest payments that it's projecting out for um, the future if you wanna see what a full year amortization schedule would look like. So, and you can also plug in numbers there for what a new loan would look like and get an amortization schedule. So you can compare current loan to potential new loan uh, all from that site. And again, I did link those on the resources page, so. Um, so another question on, um, so the, the webpage that you um, link to to log in, right above it, it says resources. Um, so if you wanna go to that resources link, that's where you'll see that. And then powerpay.org is where it's gonna take you um, to that whole suite of tools. And there's a whole lot of other things on the PowerPay website as well, but um, an amortization schedule. Um, certainly one of the things that you can do. Now, I also linked um, a version of this um, chart that we're seeing here as well. This is also from the Federal Reserve Board. Again, it's getting a little bit um, dated, um, but I like the flow of what they do and I couldn't find a current version that has this same flow. So I linked back to that um, same PDF file that they have. But essentially what this lets you do is um, kind of compare um, the current loan, your principal and interest portion only, so not your taxes, not your homeowner's insurance, none of those kind of things, to a new loan, see what your monthly savings would be. And then if you're itemizing your tax return and that interest is tax deductible, um, you would enter in what the total of your marginal federal and state income tax rates are, um, subtract those from one, so if you're paying here in Montana, let's say 15% federally and 8% at the state level, that'd be a total of 23%. Subtract those from one, we get 77% and we would reduce that monthly savings to 144 because you're also losing some tax deduction um, as well when you did the refinance. So most people aren't gonna be in that situation there in red and we can simply use the monthly savings um, from above. And then we can figure out um, a total of what all those fees and closing costs are gonna be. Um, and in this case, the example I was running, there was a little over $6,000 um, to get this savings of $187. Um, so we would have to have this loan for 34 months to essentially recover back the cost that we spent in terms of um, refinancing the loan. So if you intend to stay in the home for 34 months um, or longer, it's probably gonna work out good in terms of a financial decision. If you were to sell the home in 24 months, probably the refinancing wouldn't end up um, paying back. But there is a chart and it's got some explanations on it a little more than what I can provide uh, here as well um, to walk you through this. But this idea of kind of months until you've recovered your cost is one way that a lot of people like to look at um, refinancing. And I do see that Carrie was able to put those links um, to the resources page in the chat window. So. For those of you that wanted that link, you can follow that uh, directly and then go to Power and Pay from there. So once you've kind of thought your way through some of these things, um, kind of circle back to why you're refinancing. Is it we're trying to lower our monthly payments because maybe our monthly cash flow and budgeting is, is a challenge? And so you, if you could free up 100 bucks, you know, that would be a good thing. Maybe that's the goal. Maybe you're even willing to go from 22 years left on your loan back to 30 to free up some cash, you know, uh, cash flow to pay for other expenses that you need to. Um, there's nothing wrong with um, doing something like that. It may make your, you know, total financial picture look better. You know, other folks are looking to pay off that um, loan sooner. Uh, maybe they're looking to lower their interest payments total. So maybe that's shortening the loan. Maybe that's getting a lower interest rate. And maybe others have um, some expense they need to cover. Maybe they're starting a business or paying for a remodel, paying for you know college for someone, right? And they've got equity in their home and they want some access to that to do some other things. A good um, example of, you know, that you kind of need to have in the back of your mind too is how long you're gonna live in this home. It makes a big difference to these calculations. If you're gonna, if you're thinking, you know, well, as soon as my youngest child graduates high school, we're gonna relocate and that's three years from now. 
you know, keep in mind that it's pretty likely you're going to sell that home in three years and we don't want to do a refinancing that isn't going to uh, provide the financial benefit um, we're looking for until we've been there for four years. Uh, so those are kind of some just something to keep in mind as well. And there's a question and maybe somebody could clarify about um, is cash out interest different um, and maybe uh, you could clarify that question a little bit. I'll see if I can um, address it. Um, let me go through a couple of examples here and then we'll circle back and, and get some more um, questions. So these are actually all examples of people that have called me over the past few years um, wanting to talk through kind of some different situa situations. So this gentleman, I've changed some names here. Um, we'll call him Bill. He's 64. He had five years left on his mortgage. He has a balance of $70,000. Um, and he's looking to make, um, or he's currently got monthly payments of 1300. He really wants to retire, um, but he can only afford about $600 per month of payments based on what his retirement income would be if he retires today. So if he retires today, he's going to be short about $700 in terms of being able to make his mortgage payment. Um, however, um, he refinanced to a 30 year mortgage that lowered his monthly payments to $310 per month. And that let Bill retire now, which was really the goal that he was trying to achieve. Um, obviously, he's going to be making payments for 30 years instead of five, but his goal wasn't necessarily to reduce the total interest or to pay the house off earlier. It was to get his cash flow in a situation um, so that, you know, he could make this retirement happen now, which was really um, his primary goal. So, again, might not be that financial number that we calculated earlier, but this refinancing met Bill's goals. You know, another example here was a, a married couple, um, we'll call them Kelly and Sarah. Um, they had been in a home for about nine years, um, age 44, had about $250,000 left on their um, mortgage. Um, and they just simply wanted to refinance to see if they could pay that loan off sooner. So instead of 21 years left, they wanted to see if they could get that paid down. Um, so they actually went to a 15 year uh, mortgage. They were able to lower their interest rate pretty significantly, saved them over $60,000 in interest over kind of the life of that loan and paid it off six years earlier. So for them, it was all about kind of reducing total interest. They were willing to make some higher payments um, than they currently were as well um, and get that home paid off. Another um, Couple, and I've had a, a few different folks that have um, come in with essentially this situation. Um, a couple that was in their later 20s had, had purchased a home actually on a 15 year mortgage originally, and that was three years ago, but they still had a balance of 260,000 monthly payments of 2200, which was perfectly fine in their budget. Um, but Julie wanted to quit working. Um, they had a second child coming and decided that the cost of two kids in daycare, that it was actually better for her to step away from the workplace for a while and, and, and provide daycare for the kids. So they refinanced their remaining amount to a 30 year loan, cut their payments in half. It allowed them to be a one income family, um, you know, which allowed Julie then to be able to provide um, daycare for the two kids, at least until school age. So again, wasn't necessarily a dollars and cents lower interest payments um, situation. Uh, but this refinancing met their goal. All right, and I did get a clarification on that question. So it said, um, I've heard that when refinancing and using the cash out option, there's a higher interest rate for pulling out cash from that refinance. Is this true and, and, and how much higher would that interest rate be? Um, well, I would vary from lender um, to lender. So there's not necessarily a fixed rule for the whole country or from the Federal Reserve or anything like that that says cash out refinancing have to have a higher interest rate. Um, one thing about doing a cash out um, rate is that um, it is gonna push your loan to value uh, ratio up compared to where you were currently at if that home hasn't changed in value. So if you did have $100,000 loan balance against a $300,000 home. Um, if you 
took another hundred thousand out, you know, to use for college education or remodeling, the new loan would be two hundred thousand based on that. And that higher loan to value ratio may have some banks adjust their rate um, because there is just a little bit more risk in that sense. But there's not a hard and fast rule that they have to charge you more um, because you're doing a cash out refinancing. So uh, there's another uh, question that's come in here too. Um, where did you find your interest rates? Um, what is it projected going into the first quarter of January and March of 2021? Um, and are there places that we can send people to stay on top of this type of information? So in terms of the interest rates that I showed you today, those or today, those were all interest rates from banks that have a physical presence here in the Bozeman area. So they were posted on their website. Some of them post uh, rates weekly. A couple that I looked at were posting um, rates daily as well. And all of those were subject to you being credit worthy. So they post them there, but they won't promise them to you until you actually apply and have your credit worthiness um, check. Now, rates do vary some between states and across urban versus rural. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to say if what's the best place for your um, situation, but certainly you can get yourself in the ballpark by looking online at a variety of different um, lenders. But then when it actually comes down to applying, you know, a specific bank will give you a specific quote and they'll probably also tell you how long it's good for. So they may say we're offering 3% and that's good until Tuesday. Um, after Tuesday, the rate may change and then you can choose to lock in that rate and accept it prior to that or see what happens to the rate after that day um, expires. So um, another question has come in. Um, what's your opinion of paying um, your mortgage payment every two weeks instead of once a month as a way to pay off your mortgage? Um, MSU employees are going to be paid every two weeks um, starting next year. Um, so that is true at MSU. We're going from monthly to a every two week pay period uh, coming up in the spring. Um, many lenders are certainly happy to um, allow folks to pay say half their payment on the first of the month and half on the 15th and the total is the same as it would be otherwise. Because you're making both halves of those before the due date, um, you're, so you're paying in advance a little bit, that can actually help you save a little bit of interest. So um, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. It'll save you some interest. I would just check with your um, lender to make sure they're willing to set that up for you. I'm sure most of them are. Um, and so it might match better with your cash flow, and two, it may also um, save you some interest over the life of that um, loan as well. So I will be happy to stay on and um, take any more questions, but um, I did want to mention, um, and for those folks that may have to jump off, um, there is an evaluation link that Carrie put in the chat window. When I close the uh, webinar today, it will automatically take you there, but for those that leave earlier, if you want to go to that, we'd appreciate it if you'd answer those few questions. Um, and then just a reminder, next week, Carrie Johnson will be talking about budgeting, and then we will take a little bit of a break and we'll do three more sessions in December, um, starting with tips for good credit management, also um, being taught by Carrie Johnson um, there as well. And another question that's come in here is, um, how much does two incomes play a role in refinancing and payments? I know it's obviously better to have um, two incomes, but just curious if you knew how much of a difference um, it would be. Um, so there's two, there's a couple things to think. One is the total amount of income that both um, co-applicants are bringing to um, the bank. So, you know, if I make 40,000 and my spouse makes 40,000, we're bringing $80,000 of, of documentable income. Um, one nice thing about having two different people earning that is if one of the two spouses were to lose their job, we still have 40,000 of that 80,000 available, as opposed to a single applicant having $80,000 of income. If they lose their job, the family income may fall to zero. Uh, so there can be some advantage of diversifying the income, but then obviously in many cases, having a second income means to more total income too which uh, will help in your credit worthiness. And a lender is gonna take a look at not only your income, but what your um, debt obligations are to other things like student loans, car loans, those kind of things. Um, and they're gonna have an assessment of, do you have enough income to cover your 
expected expenses. And that's going to be one of the factors in determining whether or not you're um, credit eligible. So it's not the only factor, uh, and it's hard to quantify exactly, but um, certainly the more income you can bring to your lender, the happier they will be, and the more likely you are to either get approved or maybe a slightly better rate. Um, and then again, they may give you a little bit of sort of bonus points for having the income diversified a little bit as opposed to all from one place. Great question. So, well, I think we have um, run out of time here today. I appreciate everybody staying with me and uh, all the extra questions that made us run a little bit long. Uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me, um, you know, via email. Happy to try to clarify anything we didn't get to here today. So. Um, thank you everyone for joining us, and I hope that you'll be able to join us um, a week from today for Carrie Johnson's presentation.